The noted preacher Fred Craddock remembers being a child and playing hide-and-seek with his brothers and sister. You remember the game, don't you? One person in the group is called It, which means they hide their eyes and count to 100. Then the person who is It announces, ready or not, here I come. When his sister was it, Fred remembers that she cheated. One, two, three, four, five, 97, 98, 99, 100, ready or not, here I come. But he didn't care that she cheated because he was well hidden. Fred was under the porch. He was way up under the steps of the porch and she searched. She went behind the trees and back around front, in the barn and out of the barn, in the corn crib and out of the corn crib. Round and around she searched. His sister passed him again and again. She'll never find me. She'll never find me. Fred was confident in his hiding place. But after a while, it hit him. She'll never find me. So he stuck out a toe, and she saw it. You're it, you're it, she said to Fred. And then he crawled out, ah, oh, phooey, you found me. Then Fred asks, what did I want? To be hidden? Well, yes, but what did I really want? You know the answer, so I wonder, what about when it comes to God? Are there times when we attempt to hide our faults, our fears, especially our foibles? Our brokenness is somewhere in there as well. The vulnerable nagging that says we don't have it all together. Perhaps the difficulty of expressing a desire to know God lies in the distress of exposing that emotional side of life. After all, each of us has essential parts, the ones on the outside, as well as the ones on the inside, too. Staying distant from each other, from God, well, sometimes it's easier. Many years ago, during a seminary internship, I served as a hospital chaplain in Philadelphia. I had the opportunity to walk through many open doors into a patient's room. Some were happy to chat with me, with anyone who would come by, really. For others, though, with the first mention of the word chaplain, a pang of dread became visible upon the patient's face. Had the chaplain come with bad news, even before the doctor arrived? Was there a grim diagnosis about to be delivered? Every once in a while, I would walk through one of those open doors to meet someone who would say, thank you for visiting, but you don't need to spend time with me. There are so many other sick people here. I'm sure you need to visit with them instead. On more than one occasion, this also happened to be a patient who was hooked up to more machines than I wanted to count. Clinging to life, their condition was serious. It was the person awaiting a transplant or a risky procedure, unable to give even a glancing reveal of themselves as the toughest circumstances also happened to provide the most fortified of places to hide. Go on, chaplain. Go see the others. Go spend time with the people who really need it. And all the while, in the midst of the, the monitors and the alarms and the treatment plans and specialists, what that person wants is the courage to say, chaplain, come over. Hold my hand. Pray with me. But being found by God is not so much about a literal place that a person can go. 
seeking acceptance is about finding the source of support and provision that contributes to the truly authentic movements of life. Now, in reading from John's Gospel this morning, the disciple Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Now, we don't know in what way Philip asks this question to Jesus. Standing among his disciples, did he shout it to Jesus above the heads of others? Did he whisper it under his breath, hoping that even Jesus would not hear? Was he sincere in his request of seeing God? Though Philip wants Jesus to show him the Father, somewhere deep down inside also sits that fundamental longing to be found. That's what we want to know, the assurance of understanding who we are and whose we are. So what does it take to grasp this type of a question? What does it take to understand this issue of who we are and whose we are? The psalmist sees it this way, saying that as the heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Likewise, the Apostle Paul says something similar to the church in Rome. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature and power Indivisible as they are, have been understood and seen through the things that he has made. And while this is true, Philip is, isn't looking toward the skies or the trees or the hills. Philip is actually standing right there with Jesus as he asks, show us the Father. And Jesus responds to Philip, well, where have you been all this time that we've been together? Philip, where were you when the lame man at the pool got up and walked? Philip, where were you when the blind man saw his hands for the first time? Where were you when the centurion's servant got up from his sickbed? Where were you when the hungry crowd was fed? Philip, where were you when Lazarus came out of the tomb? Philip asks asks Jesus to show us the Father, and Jesus says to him, How can you say, show us the Father? Nothing has been hidden. Jesus says, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. As it turns out, the Lord has been standing right there with Philip this whole time. So what does it mean to be found? In hearing Philip's story, my sense says that a person must check their pride at the door. That feeling of self-sufficiency goes up on the coat rack as, as well. One preacher I know remembers a man pacing outside of the church back and forth, back and forth, deciding whether he would eventually go in. I've heard people sarcastically tell me that if they did, the roof, the, church, the roof of the church would cave in if they entered. So do they want to be found? What will a person give to see the Father? It's, it's strange territory to consider questions like these. It occurs to me that on Mother's Day, instead of asking about seeing the Father, it's worth considering a glance toward our mothers. Each of us has a mother, of course, though for some, the term mother can have differing relationships. Mothers can be biological, though not exclusively. The women among us are all spiritual mothers, despite a genetic connection or not. I'll bet in the, in the searching deep, in the places where we know God's love to be most dearly experienced, that there is a mother of our faith standing close by as well. Some time ago, I was doing a little research on one of my grandmothers. My mother's mother was a petite lady 
who was active in her Presbyterian church and was occasionally known for bossing someone around. I always knew her as living in a small town among the hills of Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. Her name was Jane, and though I knew her in Virginia, she grew up at a school in Frenchburg, Kentucky that was planted by the old United Presbyterian Church denomination. Now, her father served there as superintendent, as her mother taught in the classrooms. When her mother died after the birth of her youngest brother, her father married a Baptist from Iowa who came to teach at the school, as well as to tend to this widower with five young children. As the daughter and stepdaughter of Presbyterian missionaries, my grandma's upbringing gave her a deep sense of giving one's life in the care of others without judgment, without pride. Just do for them, because the Lord has first done for you. And in doing so, we see the Lord's presence among us. I will always remember her deep commitment to sharing the work of God's mission to others, including my mother, who shared this same passion with me as well. Now, as I explored these old newspapers of my grandma's early life, I found a couple of entries that would be of interest to all of you as well. In the October edition of the Frenchburg Reporter from 1939, there's an entry recording a gift from the Women's Mission Society of Evans City. Additionally, in the November edition from 1944, a visitor named Ruth Ripper from Evans City, PA, is recorded as traveling from here to that mission school in a connection of ministry and fellowship. I know there are still Rippers in Evans City. Maybe you knew Ruth and you could tell me more about her. And though hidden away in an old newspaper, I was able to find a record shown of how the foremothers of this congregation showed the presence of God through their prayers, support, resources, and ministry to the continual work of helping children and even to the work of working with my family, building up the kingdom of God in Kentucky all those many years ago. The poet Maya Angelou, describing her mother, reflects, I would say that she encouraged me to develop courage, and she taught me to be courageous herself. I wonder if we can say the same about a life of faith. Well, it seems to me that you and I share a similar call to speak the name of Christ and to live the life he asks of us. We share love because we have received an eternal life. We help God save lives because God first saved us. And as we look to Christ, we are shown the Father, also through the presence of our mothers, as we see the love of God among us. It's by the faith of others that we are found, and in response we are called to go with courage and to show God's handiwork, because it makes us who we are.